Spatial opposition between the dark corner of temple and the open field are important because they are particular to the Hindu context, something AIDS does not address. Interestingly, the opposition here is not that a hard ascetism contrasted with a soft romanticism. Rather, it is posed as a distinction between flowers and incense and the hard ground and the life of everyday toil. It is not nature that intoxicates and is soft, but the ascetic life caused by mind-numbing ritual. If we see AIDS in the light of the conflated beliefs that informed AIDS' redemptive aspirations for Ireland, the Irish poet's fascination with the Tagore makes perfect sense. Ireland's Celtic culture had been almost wiped out by Christianity, modernization, and British colonialism. So Tagore's work, Indo-Celtic in spirit, offered a hope that could help invent Irish nation. His gravestone in Drumcliff Churchyard, Ireland, AIDS gravestone, is inscribed with the epitaph, you all know, cast a cold lie on life and on death, horsemen pass by. Thank you for all. My paper is Gender Discrimination in Francis Imbuga's Aminata. Oh, Francis Imbuga is a committed writer from uh, East Africa. Like Ole Soinka and other committed writers, Francis Imbuga, a Kenyan playwright, fervently believes that drama should reflect the realities of life. He gives a special place to his women characters by exposing the unjust gender discrimination in the male dominant society. He is perhaps the one American, I'm sorry, dramatist who is preoccupied with injustice done to women and their emancipation from the burdensome traditional legacies. In his most powerful play, Aminata, he has realistically dealt with the theme of women's rights to inherit parental property. The play, the play presents the plight of women who, even in the most modern world, are unable to... The name of the character is also Aminata, this protagonist. The benevolent young liar is steadfast and committed to bring about gender change, equality and social change with her concerted efforts to inherit her late father's land. Like a lioness, she exhibits her fighting spirit. She says, I shall fight them to the bitter end. In the process, she faces stiff resistance from her male counterparts from her own family. Her father pastor N. Goya, an embodiment of equality, peace and love, preached gender equality. To put the same into practice and to break away from all taboos of discrimination, he felt a controversial, I'm sorry, he left a controversial will according to which his daughter Aminata should inherit his small gift of three acres of his own land. But her uncle, Jumba, the headman of the village and a representative of the old order who is uniquely conscious of his responsibility for the integrity of tribal traditions and man's absolute authority, vehemently opposes land inheritance by his niece, Aminata. He comes out openly that by leaving a piece of land for Aminata, N. Goya died their loss of ages. Unable to bear the thunderous response to the pastor's call of equality, Jumba, the pastor's brother, finds fault with him. He says, N. Goya began that equality nonsense among our women folk. Now they actually believe we are equal." End quote. While the other characters like Mama Rosina, Jumba's wife, and Nuhu, the village mason, speak of the virtuous qualities and generosity of Aminata, the male members of her own family, Jumba and Ababio, the Sanchest supporters of tradition, show little interest in her abilities. Jumba declares, what? A daughter of ours, a woman, to come and inherit land here? He strongly resolves N. Goya's land is Membe's land. Membe is the uh, name of the place. Membe's land. And uh, it belongs to the sons by tradition. Even Aminata's husband suggests her that she should uh, drop the idea of inherit the land. Jumba, in a perturbed state, calls for the meeting of the elders of the stool. Uh, this is uh, the committee which decides on the important uh, aspects of the village. 
as Jumba does not want the ceremony to take place during his headmanship, he cunningly decides to resign as the headman and chooses Mama Rosina, his wife, for the position. Thus, he wants to teach a lesson to the elders by putting Rosina to test whether a woman can conduct the village affairs successfully. In the capacity of a new head, head person, Mama Rosina, Juma's wife, arranges the symbolic handover of the land through the soil container to Aminata. While M. Balto, the son of Zumba, is about to hand over the container to Aminata, Ajiji, the village idiot, bursts in and announces, Ababio is dead. Yes, hanging with rope around neck, Ababio is dead. The soil container falls from M. Balato's hand and breaks, scattering the soil all over. Aminata also breaks down, unable to bear the loss, and the play ends with the words of Zumba. It is not yet too late to learn what have we done, what have we done. Thus, Zumba, the traditionalist, warns the people against the violation of tradition and of its devastating consequences like the death of a baby. Aminata, a liberally educated young lawyer, terms her opponents' low ideas of women as taboos. They are like the dried leaves of a, a rootless tree. She questions Jumba whether it is her misfortune to be a woman. Thus, Imbuga not only portrays Aminata as a victim of male domination, but also a woman who gains strength from such a suppression. As, as Sushila Singh, an Indo-Anglian feminist critic puts it, the woman-centered perspective now locates specific virtues in the female experience. This concept of the polarization of difference isolates and defines those aspects of women's experience which prove to be the potential source of their strength with a promise of better future for humanity. This is a kind of consciousness that articulates the hidden and suppressed voice, thereby generating power in the victims out of their own victimization." End quote. Imboga continues to expose the gender discrimination authentically in the play. According to tradition, it is the son who should buy a coffin for his dead father. But Ababio, a good-for-nothing drunk, the son of late pasta, is not in a position to buy it. It is Aminata who has bought it. Even though the duty of a male member of the family has been performed by a woman, the male counterparts are unable to locate or find a better man, a better woman in Aminata than a man. Jumba grudgingly shouts, Aminata may have bought a coffin for her father, but that doesn't mean that doesn't make her a woman of Membe because she is a married woman and as such she has no right to interfere in the affairs of Membe. In an attempt to prevent her from inheritance of the land, he declares that Ngoe's land is Membe's land and it belongs to the son as per tradition. Thus the domination of men over women in the name of tradition is powerfully and convincingly brought out in the play. For all the help she has rendered to her own brother, Abhyabhyo, he finds fault with her. He says, Aminata is my, not my sister. She is a beast, a she-elephant, elephant, that uh, she wants to trample everyone under her feet. Uh, thus, despite Aminata's accomplishments, her abilities have not been recognized. In this regard, Sushila Singh lists out the reasons for such hatred and subordination of women. I quote, uh, human experience for centuries has been synonymous with the masculine experience, with the result that the collective image of humanity has been one-sided and incomplete. Women has not been defined as a subject in her own right, but uh, merely as an entity that concerns man either in her real life or in his fantasy life. Thus, in Aminata, Imbuga offers 
as a fascinating account of a, a professional woman's concerted struggle to assert her right and proclaim her identity in the patriarchal society, only to annul her attempts by a traditional technicality." End quote. One can understand the appalling gender discrimination and the ill-treatment of women in African society as the pastor himself narrates. Our mothers lived like prisoners. There were numerous activities in which they were not permitted to join. Indeed, they were even barred from eating certain, certain types of uh, foods. This method enhances the literary quality of her language. The ordinary is described in language that is extraordinary. She, uh, this pro she probably does to create a better understanding in the mind of the reader. Where verbal language fails in, uh, in the novel, she resorts to nonverbal sounds such as the forest making she, she actually transcribes them in uh, orthographic uh, symbols here. Where English fails, she uses Hindi. Soar ka bacha, ullu ka patta, oh ye ladki zara si diwani lagti hain. So she mixes, there's a lot of code switching as well. Where phonology matters, she resolves the AW4. And this is supplemented by, okay. And she also uses a lot of cataloging techniques and uh, she, at times she separates words and at times she even reduces the spaces between the words and it turns out to be a long word. I'll quickly skip and read out. The structure of the novel is not chronological at all times and there are a lot of epiphanies to every character. The style is dynamic, spontaneous and descriptive. It makes the world look like itself it is an unselfconscious speech of happenings, processes, and becomings. The novel is full of metaphors and similes that add to the literariness of the text. If one is moving from description to interpretation, as proper stylistic analysis should, we could conclude by saying that the novel in, is many things rolled into one with an opportunistic use of the English language in the inheritance of loss. Thank you, Chair. Dear participants and students, good morning to all of you. Before I start my presentation, let me thank the organizers and madam for giving me the opportunity to present my paper. The topic of my paper is Buchi Yamachetas, The Joys of Motherhood, an attempt to reconstruct the identity and subjectivity of the image of Nigerian women protagonists. The African novel has until recently been remarkable for the absence of what might be called the feminine point of view. This has been partly due to the dearth of female African novelists. Those few voices like Flora Nwapa, who attempted to present portraits of African womenhood from a female point of view, are muted. The presentation of women in the African novel has been left almost entirely to male voices like Chinua Achibi, Amadi, Naguji, Arma, Soinka, etc. And their interest in African womenhood has, has had to take second place to numerous other concerns. These male novelists who have presented the African women largely with the traditional milieu have generally communicated a picture of male dominated and male oriented society and the satisfaction of the women with this stage of things has been completely taken for granted. HB and Naguji and others have portrayed women who complacently continue to fulfill the roles expected of them by their Igbo society and to accept the superiority of men. Later, the emergence of women, the emergence of accomplished female African novelists like Maria Maba, Buchi Yamacheta, etc., seriously challenge all these quasi assumptions. Of all women writers in contemporary African literature, Buchi Yamacheta of Nigeria has been the most sustained and vigorous voice of direct feminist protest. In Emacheta's The Joys of Motherhood, we detect an increasing emphasis on the women's sense of self as the writer has matured, and that maturity enables her to deal more and more adeptly and convincingly with the subtleties of characterization and private introspectiveness. Buchi has become a more effective protest writer precisely because she has been increasingly successful in blending the rhetoric of impassioned protest with her maturing talent for characterization. In The Joys of Motherhood, Buchi Yamachata presents a traditional African society in which the roles of men and women are very sharply defined. I quote, you are to give her children and food, 
She is to cook and bear children and look after you and them. A woman may be ugly and grow old, but a man is never ugly and never go, grow old. He matures with age and is dignified. I unquote. In this novel, the women protagonist Nanu Igo and her creator Buchi Yamacheta sternly reject this traditional concept which consents the women to cooking, providing comfort to her husband and bearing children. In a society that lays so many premiums on children as the means of ensuring the continuity of, continuity of the family and the class, a woman's femininity seems to consist precisely in her ability to bear children. Correspondingly, an inability to conceive is regarded not merely as misfortune, but as a sign of wickedness. I quote, when a woman is virtuous, it is easy for her to conceive. I unquote. Nanu Igo, who has been so strongly aware of the society's injustice towards the female kind, is forced by her misery and the intimidation of society to accept that her loss of motherhood means loss of womanhood. The chorus of countrymen agrees that, I quote, a woman without a child for her husband was a failed woman, I un unquote. It is significant that the chorus of countrymen say, not that a woman without a child is a failed woman, but that a woman without a child for her husband is a failed woman. It clearly indicates the male domination and mere suppression of African women in African society. There is a very little concern for Nanu Ego's personal feelings and her individual suffering. She is merely a tool for the pro pro procreation of her husband's children and her worth as an individual depends on her success in performing certain functions for her husband and keeping his name free from the blemish. When Nanu Ego just fails to commit suicide, no one bothers to inquire about the personal circumstances and the mental torture that must have led her to such an attempt. And the society's concern is for the respectability of Nanu's husband, Knife. Nanu Ego feels that the women are treated as underdogs. Emacheta's portrayed a typical African father who chooses his son-in-law 